Welcome to round two this afternoon. We now have our panel discussion uh, titled The Evolution of Cancer Treatment, Immunotherapy at the Forefront. And the moderator for the panel this afternoon is going to be Professor Dorai Swami Ramkrishna. He's the H.C. Pfeffer Distinguished Professor in the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering. So there you take it over, please. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all for this discussion. Um, one of the appendages to the uh, uh, Distinguished Lecture Series is this exciting panel discussion each time on some burning topic of the day. So today it is on the evolution of cancer treatment, immunotherapy at the forefront. And if you don't mind, I would like to start off with saying a few words about our distinguished visitor. Uh, although there's been, I don't want to embarrass him by more horn tooting on his behalf, but the issue is that uh, Professor Chakravarti, uh, Professor Rakesh Agarwal, and myself have come from the same uh, academic institution. I was a faculty member where Arup was a student, but much later after I had left IIT Kanpur, uh, and so the high point of the day was that uh, Rakesh summoned one of his students to take a picture of Arup, Rakesh, and myself. The one significant absentee was Rakesh Jain, which is what Arup uh, pointed out. So we'll get with the panel discussion and uh, start off this with a very germane topic of the day, uh, the uh, immunotherapy angle um, approach to uh, treating cancer. So we'll start with a brief overview of the current role of immunotherapy and introduction. I will do the introduction of panel members. Uh, this is the panel that you see starting with. Uh, uh, we have been imposed on uh, Professor Takraburthy to make any formal statements, unless he feels provoked by the presentations of any of the panelists and he wants to make some observations, he's absolutely welcome to do so. So, uh, notice that this is the different approaches that uh, are part of cancer immunotherapy, basically leveraging the, the uh, immune system to fight cancer that to do it rather than uh, another kind of drug. So this is how the evolution of cancer therapy has happened. It started with chemotherapy, but now it's moving towards the targeted therapy and immunotherapy together. And, and we will see what the different panelists have to say. Uh, we begin with Sandro Matasevic who is an assistant professor in industrial and physical pharmacy, Center for Cancer Research. He will be addressing the immunotherapy of solid tumors with genetically engineered natural killer cells. This is his area of work. The lab targets uh, immunometabolic reprogramming of immune cell function in solid tumors by immunoengineering cells to redirect inhibition and to sustain anti-tumor functions. A widely targeted solid tumor in the lab is uh, glioblastoma, highly immunosuppressive with no treatment. So. All right, thank you. My name is Sandra Matosovic. I'm an assistant professor in industrial physical pharmacy, and my lab works on immunotherapy. Um, as you heard now, there are many types of immunotherapy. Uh, all of them target various types of immune systems. So there are antibodies that target checkpoint inhibitors, there are vaccines, but also there are cell therapies. And this is the area that my lab works. Specifically, we work with one particular type of cell. It's called a natural killer cell. Um, this is in contrast to what you may have all heard of can be familiar with T cells and CAR Ts are therapies that are FDA approved. And so uh, another type of cell is a natural killer cell. Usually these cells are, um, the, the type of therapy that we particularly are focused on is uh, called adoptive cell transfer. This means uh, we take uh, patients, so patients with very severe cancers, we take their blood and we isolate the cells from these patients, we genetically engineer them outside of their bodies, and we use various immunoengineering and synthetic biology approaches to re-engineer these cells to be much more potent at fighting the cancer that we're not able to fight before being, uh, uh, while we're still in the body. 
and then they get reinfused back into the patients. Uh, the, uh, when it comes to natural killer cells, they're present in all of our bodies, right? We all have them, both healthy individuals and sick individuals have natural killer cells. They're always on, so whenever there's a pathogen, it doesn't have to be cancer, it can be any kind of uh, infection as well. Uh, these cells attack. Um, specifically for cancer, they attack a cell, and then they use various types of proteins on their surface. They're called uh, inhibitory inactivating receptors to kill this cancer cell. The interaction looks very much like what you see in the picture. The little cell is the uh, natural killer cell. The large cell is the tumor cell. They have a various uh, different types of antigens. The cancer cells, you, you, uh, uh, they, have they are recognized by the natural killer cells. And the NK cells then release uh, something called uh, perforins, which are small proteins that essentially pierce the, can pierce the cancer cell and kill it. Um, this, is, this has worked quite well in a lot of uh, blood tumors, so we have been able to treat uh, leukemias completely from to, uh, in people that have been refractive to multiple rounds of chemotherapy. So this therapy has also been approved by the FDA. There are two currently uh, pro current products on the market that uh, are based on genetically engineered T cells. They're called CAR Ts and were approved just about a year and a half ago. So we, we have evidence that this works in patients that for which, uh, for whom nothing, nothing has worked before. Um, so I mentioned blood cancers. There are also a lot of other tumors that are not blood specific, right? There's, uh, there's brain cancer, breast cancer, and a lot of solid tumors, and they look more like this. There's no individual cell anymore. Now you're dealing with a tumor mass that usually has to be removed by surgery. Uh, it has to then, if surgery doesn't work, you have to hit it with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy doesn't work, you have to hit it with radiotherapy, sometimes in combination, sometimes at the same time. When it comes to the immune system around the solid tumor, it's very difficult, right? Not only because there's a lot of inhibitory molecules that are floating around the solid tumors, but also because getting into a mass like that is really difficult for the cells. They can penetrate. And so even for the tumor that, 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 is, uh, uh, that can be targeted uh, with specific targeting uh, cells, uh, getting into deep uh, tumors is very difficult. And this is reflected in clinical data. Any CAR-T trials that are currently playing, this is about a year old data or so, uh, everything that you see in gray on the slide is uh, no response. So any type of cancer that we really haven't had any response with the, with the immunotherapy yet, uh, with cells. Uh, and you'll see a lot of them have had nothing uh, in terms of uh, disease that has uh, been able to be controlled. Um, that also that, that speaks to the complexity of the tumors. These are very heterogeneous, highly mutative tumors, but also it speaks to the fact that antigen recognition may not be sufficient to be able to eradicate very difficult tumors such as brain cancer or breast cancer, um, which, uh, you know, for which surgery and other things haven't worked. And again, a lot of these tumors have been tested after in patients after they've already tried chemotherapy, after they've tried traditional, you know, uh, radiation and traditional medicines. Um, what do we do in order to re-engineer? So now we're talking about the engineering, immunogenering of these cells. What do we do? Uh, and this is something we do in our lab. There are gene fragments that we synthetically make in the lab that can redirect cells. So in our bodies, natural killer cells are going to naturally find a cancer cell and go and kill it. Um, when it comes to complex cancer, they are no longer able to do that. They are very inhibited. Cancer is much more potent. So what happens in a very complex tumor, we have to give them a boost, and the boost is done by engineering, right? We use uh, genetic engineering to target the cell specifically to recognize specific pathways, antigens, proteins on the surface of cancer cells. And this, like I said, has worked very well in blood cancers. In solid tumors, it's difficult. Um, one of these types of genes is called a chimeric antigen receptor, but we have also different other types of uh, genetic tools that we can use to sort of re completely redirect these cells. After they're engineered, we give them back to the patient as a sort of a genetically engineered cell. Um, one specific pathway, just very quickly in our lab that we target is a lot of solid tumors are, are characterized by hypoxia, that's low oxygen. Low oxygen triggers the expression of a lot of enzymes on cancers that are inhibitory and they release, prote uh, they release metabolites. One of the metabolites is adenosine. Every solid tumor has something what we call adenosine fog, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's some, ty some type of... Um, adenosine that's extracellular released and it just sort of floats there and every time it finds an immune cell that's trying to attack this cancer, it inhibits it. Uh, so we want to block that. And one of, one of, our, uh, one of our current projects in the lab is to re-engineer these cells to um, overexpress proteins that are usually blocked due to adenosine and then to block CD73, which is the enzyme that causes the production of this very inhibitory um, 
bear inhibitor to metabolite. And CD73 is expressed in a lot of cancers, brain cancer, breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, and a few others express very high amounts of CD73. Um, so we can engineer these cells genetically in the lab very efficiently, and we also have shown that these genetically engineered cells can be reinfused back into mice, and this mice, uh, this is a lung cancer model, uh, can very effectively target um, uh, can very effectively lead to inhibition of the tumor growth compared to just an antibody treatment alone, uh, meaning that the boost that the NK cells that have been genetically engineered give this, this immune system is quite, um, quite significant. And we also show um, that these cells can penetrate um, the tumor is much more. So if we do hemocystochemical staining, we take the tumor out, we, we, we section it, and we see how deep the cells can get into the tumor. We see that they get a little deeper if you try to block this adenosine production. Um, tumor infiltration is a big issue with, uh, with a lot of solid tumors, so this is, uh, this is a big question for us. Um, and just the last slide is, this is what we also what we do in the lab, and this is sort of some, you can be really creative with the immunoengineering, you can be really creative with synthetic biology, and you can create really efficient systems that can only target one tumor, uh, and you heard from the previous talk, uh, you know, pathogens in cancer particularly is very smart. They can mutate, they can evolve the expression over time, and so you can use synthetic biology to sort of try to outsmart it, which is what we try to do in the lab. You uh, target two antigens at the same time, you target three antigens at the same time, uh, and things like that. So that's really uh, a combination of sort of, uh, you know, bioengineering and uh, immunology, which is what, uh, what, what, what we do in the lab. Um, and having said that, um, I will pass on to the next, uh, next speaker. Okay. So the next person who, uh, the panelist, is the uh, Xiaoping Bao, who is one of our latest additions to the faculty. He's an assistant professor. Uh, the, the, basically, the interest of uh, the Bao lab is to innovative technology uh, use innovative technology to engineer human stem cells as models of human development and disease as well, to develop cellular and molecular therapies as next-generation therapies of degenerative, uh, for degenerative diseases. One focus is the production of off-the-shelf immune cells, such as T and natural killer, and uh, I guess you can sort of see this for yourself, and I'll let Xiaoping start his presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Runki, for the uh, introduction. So um, I'm a new PI here, and my lab works on, on stem cell-based um, therapy, just uh, using, you know, like a stem cell to make uh, uh, functional cells. Um, so immune cell is one of my target. So uh, as, you know, Sandra uh, mentioned uh, in his slides, there are so many, you know, like a uh, hot area called, you know, CAR-T therapy. Um, but if you look at the least, uh, you know, um, CAR-T therapy, mainly um, when a patient have, you know, uh, like a cancer, when he, you know, um, go to the hospital, the doctor will kind of take the T cells from this patient and then, you know, like expand and also uh, engineer the T cell with the CAR, you know, construct and then uh, expand again and then inject back to the, you know, patient. So, uh, this is kind of the overall, you know, a flow sheet to make a CAR T therapy. Uh, with that, I want to say it's pretty, you know, like uh, useful, especially for, you know, leukemia or, you know, some broader um, tumor. Um, but there are still, you know, like uh, several major challenges in this field. Uh, as I list here is, uh, you know, three. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, sometimes it, it takes, you know, like a, a a, a specific, you know, time period to make the CAR T therapy. So it's not a good for, you know, acute um, cancer patient. That's one. And the second is the CAR T, sometimes they uh, have limited, you know, proliferation. So when you transplant, the T cell may not be enough. And the third one is uh, uh, most of the CAR T now is not, a, you know, so um, effective in killing the solid tumor. Um, they are really good for, you know, like a uh, uh, blood or, you know, uh, cancer, but not for the solid tumor. So um, my lab or the field, the stem cell field, they are trying to uh, at least address, you know, a couple of the challenges. Um, um, particularly, we are, you know, like uh, trying to address um, two um, challenges. One is the trying to, you know, like make a universal donor cell, so we don't have to wait and go to the whole process to make the T therapy. And the uh, second one is uh, uh, with the limited proliferation of CAR T cell, 
um, the proton stem cell uh, is, you know, have the potential for unlimited proliferation. So, I mean, in theory, you can have uh, this cell, um, universal donor cell that are, um, can, you know, proliferate without the limitation and they can be uh, engineered for um, CAR T and, uh, you know, like uh, uh, ready to make the off the shelf cell product for the, you know, uh, patient. So uh, the idea here is uh, it involves two major you know area. One is how you can engineer the stem cell uh, with you know the really uh, hard tool CRISPR Cas9. You may heard of that um, to engineer the you know stem cell. Um, they are immune you know response free for every patient. That's kind of um, uh, it, it's durable and uh, it's just uh, you know like with a few. Um, Re receptors, you, you need to uh, knock out or you knock in a few uh, receptors. That's kind of knowledge from the, you know, uh, immunology field. Uh, it's doable. I'm not going to cover the detail, but uh, with this tool, you can just, uh, you know, engineer a cell line to make them, you know, kind of a universal donor. So the second part will involve, you know, the direct differentiation, uh, how you can make these cells become the, you know, functional uh, immune cells. Uh, like uh, so, if you can see, maybe not clear, uh, the stem cell go, you know, a, a series of stage uh, to become the T cell. Uh, couple, you know, stage is a, a hemogenic endothelium and a hemopotent stem cell, and then you know, go to the um, uh, lymphocyte progen, and then the. Uh, you know, immune cells or, you know, uh, kind of blood cells as well. So from this kind of uh, human development, you can use engineer way to um, promote uh, the cell, you know, differentiation to the functional T cells. So um, my previous work have, you know, established a really uh, robust protocol to make uh, uh, the stem cell to become into the hemogenic endothelial cells. So uh, this is kind of the, you know, protocol we've developed. Uh, in the lab where you just uh, hit, uh, you know, uh, the stem cell with uh, one chemical called, uh, you know, CHRR chair, uh, a winter, you know, activate. So this is a small molecule uh, without any, you know, additional um, growth factor. You can um, make uh, uh, hemogenic endothelial cells in, you know, five days. So it's pretty rapid and uh, it's pretty, you know, cost effective. And uh, uh, the efficiency uh, you can see from the um, flow sheet on the, uh, right, um, it's positive, you know, about 60% for uh, CD31 and 34. These two just, uh, you know, protein marker for endocellular um, uh, progenitor marker. And they are functional to form the tube like, uh, you know, structure on the left. And uh, importantly, these cells, when they, you know, culture on the feeder cells called OP9, uh, which is uh, uh, supposed to promote the, you know, um, immune or, you know, T cell uh, and the blood cell differentiation from this population. So uh, as a highlight here uh, on the, you know, right um, figure, uh, you may cannot see clearly, but uh, this cell population kind of capable to form, you know, the uh, functional T cells and the blood cells. So we are, try uh, we are trying to optimize the process and uh, trying to scale up. So um, for the, you know, CAR T uh, therapy and uh, um, that's, um, that's all uh, what I want to cover today. Shift the slide. The next speaker is Dr. Kim, and professor in the Department of Medicine, Health, Chemistry, and Molecular Pharmacology. Um, um, I think I'm going to let you see the interests of the um, uh, limb laboratory to save time and let him get started with his presentation, yeah. Okay, thank you for your introduction, and thank you for having me today, because I never imagined the engineering department or colleges has lots of interest for immunotherapy, so, yeah. Today, I'm gonna talk about my current work. I'm basically working on the breast cancer using the antibody immunotherapy. Yeah, I can skip this cartoon, this one is only shows some PD-1, pd one function here. What I found is, because the, everybody know, in this field, everybody has some idea about some, how we develop the antibody for PD-1, pd one which can enhance anti-tumor immunity, because PD-1, pd one is really 
well on the uh, co inhibitor receptor. That's why if we block their function, we can expect anti uh, tumor immunity should be increased. But what I found is when I checked the other person's literature or the clinical trials, antibody, they didn't pay attention to the protein modification, especially PDL1. When I checked the PDL1 protein, I found they have several post translational modifications such as postpolation and glycosylation, eucatenations. So, uh, among those, the different types of post translational modification, I found glycosylation of PDL1 protein is really important for their binding affinity. And also, the glycosylation itself can determine some antibody affinity or specificity. So we, we kind of determine the function of glycosylation of PDL1, and then we try to make the antibody which can recognize glycosylated PDL1 only, very specifically. So, and then we start from the 3,000 hybridoma, hybridoma clones, and luckily we have some clone which can block the PD-1, pd one uh, with very high efficiency, and also some of the antibody is, can induce the pd one protein internalization on their tumor cells. So the internalization, internalization means maybe we have some potential to develop the antibody drug uh, conjugate, ADC. So what we did is we add the toxin to the antibody and then treat those the PDR1 ADC to the mouse model. And then here, this is the data. Our PDR1 ADC really the kill the tumor cells in the mouse model. And here is the our proposed model. What we did is we just add PDR1 ADC, of course, those ADC, they can block the PD1, PDR1 interaction, same as other clinical used antibody. And then they can induce the internalization and go to the lysosomal degradation. After that, they can release a toxin. So toxin is, in this case, we use MMAE, which is the tubulin inhibitor. And those toxin can kill those tu uh, tumor cell directly. Also, we use the, the cleavable linker between antibody and toxin. Those, that's why those the release, the toxin can be go outside and kill other cancer cells which may not have the PDL1 expression. When we look at the PDL1 expression level in the cell, maybe PDL1 expression is very heterogeneous. That's why that's the reason we choose the bystander effect with the cleavable linkers. And the con conclusion is, yeah, we developed the first the immunotherapeutic antibody ADC and which has the uh, triple impact which is blockade efficacy and cytotoxicity and bystander effect. Here is, uh, at Purdue, I'm keep working on the PDL1 ADC model, and what we found is PDL1 resistant tumor still has the PDL1 ex expression on their surface. That's why we try to make the PDL1 ADC again, and also what we found is those resistance cells secrete lots of cytokine, and some of them really contribute to recruit for MDSC, which is the suppressive the immune cells. So that's why what we are doing here is we try to combine PDL1 ADC and the blockade antibody for to block the MDS, MDSC recruitment. Yeah, this is yeah, our lab, and then we, now we are yeah, one person just leave. That's why now we are five, and we are really enjoy the research here, and then we are making the drug history here. Thank you. So the last of the uh, panelists is uh, Dr. Min Jiang, Professor of Department of Statistics, College of Science, and Associate Director of Data Science, Purdue University Center for Cancer Research. Let the audience see your of specific interest themselves to save time, so. Please go ahead. 
Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I'm probably one of the outliers here as I'm not a biologist, I'm not a, a you know, immunologist, but I do uh, like uh, develop statistical methods that can quite general, can be broadly applied to different type of diseases, including cancer. And I think the, the one disease we did apply to is uh, arthritis, so I'm going to just share with you some of the methods we have been developed over years. So here is just a, a diagram that shows that, you know, for most of the clinical studies, so we uh, collect the uh, samples from patients including like a DNA, RNA, protein, or metabolites. And then we try to uh, look at, you know, the data from each of these samples including the uh, omics data sets which are getting more and more popular and uh, integrate them with clinical data. And uh, after the integration, we try to learn uh, new knowledge from this data and uh, translate it into the, the practice for general practitioners in the clinic. Uh, so the way we are trying to attack this problem is uh, how do we take advantage of this data and try to make that analysis much more uh, efficient and much more accurate. So the one I, a circle is where I'm going to use metabolites as one example and show you how we can do the integration for one type of data. And then I also circle the DNA and RNA to show you the example how we can integrate multiple types of data to try to improve the power of the analysis. So here is an example uh, of the project which is a consortium between IU School of Medicine and Purdue. So we started to look at one of the popular cancer in uh, the state of Indiana, it's a colorectal cancer. And this started with a collaboration uh, with Joe Pagny, I believe he's from uh, Chemical Engineer, and Marita Harrison from the, one of the faculty uh, research in can uh, cancer, uh, you know, the research at Purdue. So there are a lot of data collected in this project, including all types of omics, including genomics, metabolomics, glycoproteinomics, and, uh, uh, and proteomics. In addition to these, there are also demographic profile and clinical data. So our uh, goal here is to try to come up with a statistical model to integrate all this data, and which can help us in terms of the early detection of the cancer and monitor the disease progression and to be able to predict the survival or the treatment response. So here's one of the example, like the lower part of the corner with two tables. On the very left, you see there are two metabolites, glycine and serine. So if we look at each one of them and they would do the uh, statistical test. Uh, so the p-value is 0.6 and 0.78. And you know that none of them is even close to the like 0.05 we have been using. And uh, so that's you, the only one that you know, has the smallest p-value uh, is a violin, which is the last one with p-value 0.01. And then our collaborator was saying that, so this is only the raw p-value. And if you think about there are so many tests you are doing, if you control the family-wise error rate, none of them is significant at all. So what we are thinking about, so how we can you know, improve the analysis in terms of the, uh, the statistical power. So what we did on the right-hand side of the table is uh, what if we use the uh, knowledge from the biology, like these metabolites are not independent of each other. So we take advantage of their correlation between them, and our collaborators actually come up with uh, like 15 groups all together to indicate what metabolites actually connected with each other. So this is only a subset of the groups, but what I circle here is, is group 12, and there are only two metabolites involved, which is the same as the one that circled on the left, and you can see the p-value goes, uh, you know, drops down to 0 0.005. So this is the power of the integration. So essentially, instead of asking the question for each single metabolite, if we integrate the information, and we can actually get much more power statistically, we, you know, and that clinically it also help us by looking multiple metabolites instead of one of them, because they all contribute to the disease. And on the up top, 
corner, and you see there are uh, like three kind of networks. In. So these are the uh, results like follow up with our biological groups. We will try to identify what happens between the health individual, which is the green one, and cancer, and also somewhere in between. We only have the polyps patients, but they are not cancer yet, but they are highly, uh, you know, they have a higher risk to develop cancer later on. And so the connections just, uh, you know, indicate whether each of these metabolites are connected with each, with each other. And then the healthy one, you can see there are seven of them all together. They are nicely connected. And then when you go to the polyp stage, so there you lost some connections in between, but still, there are still seven metabolites. And when you really get into the cancer stage, so you lost more connections and you only, and you also uh, you know, lose some metabolites. So this kind of will show as a system level. So if we look at all these, you know, molecu uh, molecules rather than a single independent molecule, we can gain a lot of information and knowledge in terms of the, the way that we can understand the disease much better. So the second example I want to show you uh, is more for like the statistical method that when we look at the data, so instead of the data that you collected for this specific study, we can actually incorporate external information to try to uh, you know, take advantage of the existing database, you know, literature from PubMed or anywhere, and try to improve our analysis. So on the left-hand side, so the top corner is our statistical model, and the Y and the axis is just, uh, you know, the response, you know, the phenotypes in the clinic, and the predictors we want to look at. So if we, if we apply this to the genome-wide association studies, so the X will refer to this, you know, the G whole genome sequence. It can be DNA, it can be RNA, and we know that if we do the sequence, we can uh, get millions of predictors. But on the left-hand side, if you look at these individuals, we can rarely get a million individuals for our study. It's just way too expensive. Unless I recently heard that as VA, so there are many like veterans project, but they do have a lot of money to collect all this data. But you, in most studies, we just uh, limited by the number of sample size we can collect. And, uh, and you can see the biological pathway that we try to include. So this can be uh, at DNA level, RNA level, or metabolite level. If we look at the database, if we CAC database or any other you know, literature, there are already information related with a certain phenotype you're looking at. And we can actually incorporate this information into our current analysis through what we call the basing inference. And those are the prior uh, distribution we can uh, formally incorporate into the statistical modeling and then the left uh, lower car corner will be the, the algorithm. So instead of using the full likelihood function, we actually use uh, the median and the mode uh, for, the, for the likelihood, which makes the algorithm is very easy to implement and it runs really fast and it converts very well. And then the lower part shows the com comparison of our method with the popular methods for big data analysis, say lasso and adaptive lasso. And uh, so the, uh, the left panel is in terms of the prediction error, and uh, the two panels on the, on, the red, on the right is the false positive and the false negative. So we can actually gain much uh, lower prediction error, so in terms of the uh, different correlation, which indicated by the x-axis, because some of the genetic markers, if you're looking at a single nucleotide polymorphism, you look at genes, so they may be uh, correlated with each other, either the correlation can be low or high, so we really the correlation from zero to all the way to 0.9 in our simulation studies. And you can see the, the pink and the blue lines are the methods we develop. So it's kind of consistent in terms of the prediction error. But lasso and adaptive lasso start with a very high prediction error, but it drops when the correlation uh, you know, goes uh, higher. And also the uh, false positive rate, you can see the yellow line on the top is a lasso, which is so po very popular used in the, in the high dimensional data analysis, but then the, the label you probably couldn't see, but it's 0.8. So which means the false positive rate can be 0.8 if you use lasso for this kind of data. And adaptive lasso is doing so much better, but it's still at the level of 0.3. And so our method basically is only like around like between uh, point 0 and point 0.1. So the lower part will be the false negative rate. So all the methods are doing pretty well. So the scale here is actually uh, 10 to the minus 3. 
So the last example I want to show you is um, uh, in terms of integration of multiple types of omics data, because nowadays a lot of the high throughput technology will allow us to get, say, the DNA sequence and the RNA sequence, and maybe the, uh, the multiplied profile from the same individual or the same set of cell lines. And how do we integrate multiple types of data from the same individual to try to you know, improve our analysis. So the model here we are using uh, is called a simultaneous equation model framework. So essentially we have this Y's indicator, so it can be the gene. So if we have, say, 30,000 genes, and the, uh, on the left-hand side of the equation, it can be the first gene, and the right-hand right side of the equation can be the other, like, 29,999 genes. So basically you ask the question for each single gene and ask whether all the other genes genes will regulate this gene or interact with this gene. And by the end of the analysis of these 30,000 models, we are going to end up with this network, you know, uh, at the bottom here. So this is actually from all the immunogenes, uh, all the immunogenes, and the arrows indicate the direction of the regulation, and the different type of the lines indicate the strength of the regulation. So essentially, since the algorithm is so fast, uh, we actually have the ability to do the analysis uh, using a bootstrap method to repeat it like 10,000 times or 50,000 times. And each time we ask the same question for each of the 30,000 genes. And by the end of this, you know, 10,000 bootstrap, we collect the frequency for each connection, or each regulation. So that's the number that, uh, you know, besides each line. So this will basically tell us the direction of the regulation and how strong the regulation is. Some of them you can see is bidirectional, so basically the uh, regulation is two-way regulation. Some of them is only like one-way regulation. And we also have the uh, regulatory effect can be positive, like increase the, the uh, expression or can be down-regulate. So that will be active. Uh, indicated by different type of error. And on the right hand side of the panel is the simulation we did for different types of network. So the top one is a sparse network and the bottom one is a dense network. So for whatever the network is, we evaluate the method is quite uh, uh, robust or stable in terms of the, uh, the power and the FDR. So that's all I want to say and, oh, sorry. Oh, this is all. Thank you. Yeah, so the, Let, the last slide is basically okay. all my collaborators and the students who worked on all this project over the past like 14 years I've been at Purdue, and the bottom is the funding agency that actually make all this happen. Thank you. Okay. Let's thank the panelists uh, before we open the floor for questions. If you have questions, please raise them. If you have a particular panelist in mind, name the panelist. If you don't, that's also fine. Oh, I have a question. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you. The, a microphone? I, I'm, using I'm using it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone. I. Uh, there's an issue in the industry that there's a high rate of failure from benchtop to animal models to human studies. And I was wondering if you all had any comments on uh, maybe what researchers can do at an early stage to help um, increase the success rate of your studies, maybe from the benchtop level onward to human studies. <laughs> so, so this is correct, uh, and it's, uh, I'll comment this from the perspective of immunology and immunotherapy research. Uh, it is very correct, and um, you know, picking the right animal model is, of course, the critical first step. But it's also very difficult when you start dealing with immune systems that are very variable between patients. Um, you're very hard time to predict responses that are going to be seen in patients, and that's part of the reason why I think you're, we're seeing you know, high uh, rates of failure. I mean, there are a few efforts that um, 
are being made, and I think that some of them were mentioned today, I think that a, a better standardization of the tools that we have available could help um, uh, get better uh, responses. One of the things is um, um, there are a few labs, and I think Dr. Bao uh, uh, is, is, is working on off-the-shelf cells. We have a project, similar project in the lab. Um, currently, the way that, for example, cell therapies are being administered to patients are autologous. That means you have to be your own donor. Uh, that means that each patient is personalized medication to their patient. Well, that sounds really great because you have your own medication. That is really difficult on a manufacturing perspective because you really have to make a drug for each patient, which becomes really difficult and you can scale it up. You have to scale it out and that's not always um, economical. Uh, we don't have tools right now where these cells can be taken off the shelf, just like you go to CVS and you take a drug for you know, a, a headache. Uh, cell therapies are not there yet. But I think the, the ultimate goal is where we want to be to, to a, a, at a place where we can get you know, immunotherapies more uh, controlled in a way that we can manufacture them better. Um, that's a huge risk. Uh, to give you an example, um, Novartis, who is manufacturing the very first genetically engineered cell, it was just, just one year on the market, um, they already produced a few batches of the drug that failed specs and they had to inject into the patients for free. Uh, one injection is about half a million dollars, so they had to give that to the patient for free because they just couldn't make enough cells from the patient to give the right dose. This is an example to tell you how, how you know, it's not just failure in development, but also failure further along development. And I think the more we can maybe control our tools, uh, it's gonna maybe help us uh, make better drugs. But that's one thing. And of course, you go back to the discovery thing, that's a whole different conversation. You know, do we have the right animal model? Do we have the right data uh, to predict responses? I mean, uh, there are a lot of things that, of course, um, have to be done. All right, um, so for those of you working on CAR-T, from what I've read in literature, there's often significant um, toxic effects using these drugs, specifically like cytokine buildup and cytokine storms. What um, new methods or ideas do you guys have to uh, combat those issues? So I can answer this. I work on CAR and Ks. It's not CAR-Ts. Um, CAR-T cells induce something called graft versus Sow's disease, and cytokine, cytokine storm, which is what you mentioned, is when the immune, um, uh, immunological response is so severe and people have died in clinical trials and it ha happens to be an issue. Um, things for that is to precondition the patient. Uh, other source, other uh, solutions to uh, GVHD and the cytokine storm are to not use T cells. Um, NK cells don't, uh, don't induce GVHD as much as T cells and that's why uh, our lab is working on NK cells and other labs are doing that too because the MHC and HLA, which is the way that NK cells use, uh, recognition of cancer cells is not inhibitory. It, it's different in NK cells. Another solution to completely avoid cytokine storm inside a patient is to use off-the-shelf cells. So anything, for example, you can take stem cells and you can derive T cells from them and those cells are allogeneic. Allogeneic means that, um, that you can use one cell for different patients and it will not um, induce uh, GVHD. Uh, the reason GVHD happens mostly is because it's a mismatch the donor and the patient are mismatched and that causes the cytokine release. So um, use different types of cells or use sort of lab engineered standardized cells. That's a big effort in the industry so to avoid uh, immune, immune responses. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, as an engineering student, I want to ask that uh, what kind of advice would you give for an uh, engineering student that is trying to like enter in the medical science field or like what kind of uh, unique opportunities that are offered to us like an uh, engineering student? I, 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 I think they're turning to me because I have more gray hair. So, um, <laughs> you know, are you a chemi student? So I think you have a unique um, ability, uh, which is the following, that you have the ability to think about questions in a relatively integrated and seamless fashion from the molecular scale to the macroscopic. and. Um, I think medicine requires that sort of thinking that integrates across scales. 
um, not every kind of training provides you with that ability. Uh, for example, um, chemists are very good at thinking about molecules, but perhaps not so much about mesoscopic and macroscopic. I mean, these are all statistical arguments. I mean, not every chemist is like that and so on. But, and similarly, physicists are very good. I mean, the kinds of physicists we are talking about are very good at thinking about mesoscopic and macroscopic scales, but not so much about atoms and molecules. And, and I think, you know, um, you as an engineer have been trained to think across these scales and therefore try to connect phenomena across them, which can be extraordinarily useful. Um, so that's a very general remark. Uh, but the other point I might make uh, is that you should do what you think is right and what you think is exciting. Not what people around you tell you to do exactly is, is exciting. Um, and, and at the risk of taking just two more minutes of these people's time, they have described to you some of the frontiers of cancer immunotherapy today. Uh, I want to just briefly, in this context, since there are so many young people here, tell you about the history of this, because I witnessed some of it. But when Jim Allison, who won a Nobel Prize in October, uh, Jim was my colleague at Berkeley, when we were both there, and neither of us are now. Um, Jim was trying to understand the problem that nobody cared about at that time, which is how do T cells shut down after being activated for a while? He was not asking questions about cancer. And his graduate student was Max Crummel. And Max found that CTLA-4, actually the, the, the predecessor of Max as well, a CTLA-4 was a molecule on the surface of T cells that got expressed and turned on. When that happened, the T cells shut down. They were exhausted. And they had a ligand, which was B7, on the other side. It didn't bind B7, it didn't have. That's when Jim had the idea, after that very basic study. I mean, at that time in Keystone meetings on T cell signaling, Jim was the only person working on this. Singular, and nobody cared. And then he discovered that, I mean, he immediately had the idea that I can block this with an antibody, and in cancer, nobody cares whether your T cells are not exhausted because you're willing to deal with the side effects as long as it kills tumor cells. Okay? So that's an example. He wasn't doing what everybody else was telling him to do, and he wasn't thinking about cancer. Same with CAR T. The whole CAR T thing relies on the fact that you do not need the extracellular domain of the T cell receptor. I mean, not NK cell, but the CAR T cell part. That you, all you need is a cytoplasmic domain to do the signaling, and then you can put whatever you want on the other side. Art Weiss did that purely to discover, does the outside domain matter? He had no interest in, 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 in calcium immunotherapy. I mean, to this, he was interested in what the T cell signaling pathway does to get this tremendous sensitivity, things that Art and I still work on together. But so, you know, you should also think about doing what you think is the right thing. I mean, and not what the world tells you is the right thing. Well, the world is made up of old people. They don't know. I mean, as much, they're not going to be as adventurous as you, and you should be. So. Thank you. Thanks very much to, to all of you for, for very good presentations and all of your preparation. Um, I had a question about, with all of the learning that has occurred in, in scientific laboratories and then been translated to, to pharmaceutical companies, and all that learning in terms of uh, drug development and, and other things, can, uh, in regard to cancer immunotherapy, can some of that learning be applied to other Diseases that uh, that uh, for which the basis is all also altered immunity. I'm thinking about rheumatoid arthritis as a chronic disorder and something like sepsis in the acute setting, which is more or less immune dysfunction. So, if if uh, maybe maybe it's the two co uh, college of pharmacy colleagues who are best positioned to to answer that. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, I have a chance to look at the whole textbook of immunology recently because I have to teach yeah, this semester. Yeah, so that's why, yeah, 
this, this is a great chance to overlook some immune system and also immune disease. But I'm not the immunologist. I'm working on the cancer biology a long time. And the, my major is only belong to just one chapter. We have 17 chapter and then just last chapter talk about cancer immunotherapy. But the other one is talk about the autoimmune disease or other hypersensitivity issues, things. But what I learned from those kind of textbook, now many big pharmaceutical companies jumped in, developed their large of antibody to target the co-inhibitory receptor and stimulatory receptor. That's why now we have tons of tool to activate or inhibit specific immune cell or specific types of cell. So those things can be applied to many different types of hypersensitivity related disease or autoimmune disease. So that's why now is great time to um, apply our finding to other types of immune disease. And I will add that, yes, I agree with all of that. It absolutely can be, and I think that people are looking at that already. Uh, immunotherapy is not just T cells and NK cells. It's also dendritic cells, macrophages, MDSCs, a lot of types of cells. So if any immunotherapy has taught us anything is to really um, understand that the immune system can be completely re-engineered to be re-functionalized into very different ways. And this is what um, immunotherapy has taught us over the past, you know, 10, 20 years, and especially now. Um, so uh, can it be used? Absolutely. People are looking at retargeting these cells for various other diseases. I mean, related to the previous um, seminar, HIV, you know, CAR T cells are being looked at for HIV treatment as well, you know, in a different way than they're done for cancer. Uh, but, 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 you know, the potential is absolutely there, yes. Thank you for your presentation today. I have a small problem about the CAR T cells. So um, from what I've read and understand from the literature, that delivery of the CAR T cells has been a kind of raising issue right now. So especially to like um, solid state tumors where CAR T cells could not penetrate deep enough into the um, <coughs> center of the cells and to totally kill it. So what would you think would be some potential solution for that in the future? The CAR T therapies that are currently approved on the market um, have worked for blood cancers because they rely only on antigen recognition. That means the only thing that is, is the, it's like a Velcro, right? They recognize that antigen. Solid tumors, antigen recognition is no longer sufficient because antigen recognition is not going to be able to allow the cell to penetrate. Um, there are multiple combination approaches that people are, going, are starting to look at for solid tumors. Um, to, you know, it's a very extensive talk, topic, but um, things that people are looking at are um, co-targeting co uh, multiple antigens together with chemokines. These are proteins that allow the cells to penetrate. Um, also, uh, metabolism is particularly of interest to me because that's what we look in the lab. Um, there's a lot of metabolic inhibition. Cancer cells use glycolysis to fuel their growth very quickly that completely changes the landscape around them. Um, so co-targeting that together with antigen recognition is another strategy to help these cells survive a little longer and deeper into the tumor. Um, but, but yeah, I think it seems to be, at least my opinion, that just targeting antigen is not going to be sufficient to treat, you know, prostate cancer or brain cancer. You're really going to have to start looking at more complex approaches to get these cells in deeper um, through something alongside, you know, your binding. Uh, thank you for the presentation today, and it's very inspiring. And as in nowadays, like uh, we know in our research, the data science is playing a really big role in our research right now. So I want to ask Dr. Zhang, um, what are the major challenges we're facing in the cancer therapy? And like from all the presentation I heard, like the models we're establishing right now is really heavily relying on the high quality and high quantities of the data set. So what if we don't have the resources of those to obtain the high quality or uh, high standard data set? Is there any stat uh, uh, statistical models for us to utilize to reduce the sample size? Uh, yeah, it's tough. <laughs> so essentially, like, yeah, we do need a relatively like, larger sample size to make a lot of statistical inference. But in the, in the big data world, uh, I think you know, that's one of the major challenges. How do we 
uh, deal with data with the sample size is much, much smaller than the number of predictors in your model. Because all the, you know, the statistical textbooks with the, what we call textbook data is kind of nicely with hundreds of, uh, you know, sample size, but only kind of a handful of variables. But nowadays with the high throughput technology, we easily generate like millions of, you know, SNP data and thousands of, you know, gene expression profile. And so that's where most of the, uh, statisticians working in the big data world is, is tackling. So essentially, how do we uh, extract the information from this messy and noisy data and get a reliable, uh, you know, knowledge that can keep going for the next step, you know, either do validation in the lab with, uh, you know, cell and animal models or even go beyond this to go to the clinic. So, and there's a big area that we call uh, like, you know, uh, variable selection or data reduction. So there are all sorts of techniques have been, uh, you know, developed to try to, you know, tackle this issue in terms of, you know, either you using uh, uh, some statistical methods to uh, deal with big data, but you add a penalty term, and this penalty term is penalized for the high dimension for the noises in the data, and also one of, you know, the, uh, you know, AI, you know, algorithms you learn from lots of data data from the from the literature from the previous studies and you try to come up with a, a small subset that, that you think is a reliable predictor that you can keep going so there are, and also the, the basic inference I was talking about is uh, it's getting more popular because in the older days you know the basic inference is uh, uh, kind of you know delayed because we don't have enough computational power and uh, so with the the HPC is a high performance computing, so this kind of come back to the uh, to the stage like people, we don't need to worry about, you know, we don't have enough memory, we don't have enough space because we can, uh, you know, use the current, you know, computing technology environment uh, to be able to do a lot of uh, things simultaneously, either through the parallel computing or through the GPU, all these things. So I guess, you know, the, the area is moving forward with uh, the data being messier and larger, but with a computational tools and some newly developed statistical, uh, you know, methods and the corresponding algorithm is, is getting there. Uh, so I have a question directed to uh, Professor Chakraborty. So in the mod stochastic models that you showed, uh, how parameterized, the, parameterized are those models to, the, to work uh, with the experimental data? And uh, what is the role of the ab initio parameters and how important are they for uh, going towards maybe generalizing all the models that you showed? So, um, the answer is different for each of the classes of things I showed. So, um, for the inference that we did of the mechanistic, of the fitness landscape, or rather the prevalence landscape, uh, that of course has no parameters, that is we were inferring the parameters from the sequence. So that was just a learning problem. And so there, all the points that were just made apply. Uh, the, unless you have enough statistical power, you're not going to infer the right parameters. But then your question becomes relevant for the next stage that we did, which I'm just doing it by illustration, um, that, you know, the mechanistic models that we constructed then to try and deconvolute the prevalence from, from fitness by thinking about the evolutionary dynamics of, um, you know, population-wide immune responses. Um, certainly there were parameters. In particular, uh, the parameter that went into that was the mutation rate of the virus, uh, which is known. And in a coarse-grained model like that, uh, the other parameter is the strength of the immune response that each person put. And that we drew from a statistical distribution. And then the question is, where do different people attack this? And then also we were informed by clinical data on the distribution, the probability distribution of where people attack things. They were purely stochastic estimates. Um, and then we found that if we move those around, I mean, change those around within some, some scale, then we got similar qualitative results. 
And the only thing we wanted to test was the qualitative prediction of the order of fitness. So that was one case. Um, and the same holds when we were predicting evolution in a person, it's exactly the same questions. When we do these affinity maturation calculations in the second part, it's certainly parameters. And um, some of them are known, and others are not known. And again, the, the predictions we were making were all qualitative. That if you give a cocktail, it does this. If you do a sequence, it does this. Um, and you might say even that could be unrobust to these par unknown parameters. And I was, Ramki was asking me the same questions both this morning and right now. Um, first of all, you can never be certain that you are right because you can only think about these questions up to a certain degree of, uh, but what you can see is if the qualitative results seem very mechanistically reasonable, you feel uh, the underlying mechanism is, so then you feel a little bit more confident. The other is very important is Biological systems have what Jim Setna has called sloppy modes. That is, that most of the dynamics is determined by modes that have a lot of, not, not huge, but are relatively parameter insensitive within some range. And there are a few which are extraordinarily important. And the reason is that if a biological system was so sensitive to every parameter in this complex network. I mean, she showed you some networks there that were uh, what are called the usual hairball is the analogy. You know, the expression level of proteins in organisms varies quite a bit, not just from one organism to the other, but from you from minute to minute, right? So enormous parameter sensitivity to all those parameters would make this a very unrobust <laughs> system and so many of these modes, and you can do toy models to actually illustrate that, that you will get in dynamical sense eigenvalues with eigenvectors that are extremely soft. And so there are parameter ranges in which it will still function qualitatively give you the same answer. But you can never be sure, as I also mentioned during my talk, until you test the veracity of what you have done against in vitro and clinical data because, but, but, but you need some level of confidence built up from mechanistic understanding so on and so on before you can tell somebody to spend a million dollars to do that experiment, you know, especially monkey experiments, you know, 10 monkeys is a million dollars experiment. So. I think <laughs> we are getting to a point to when we should close this out because it's getting to be the, um, Time allotted by 15. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the panelists again uh, with a little tone of apology because we put this all together in a very short amount of time. We didn't give you the kind of time that probably you needed to prepare, but uh, you still came through and made it possible to discuss this uh, at a pretty good level. Uh, saying that, I need to also add a special note of thanks to Dr. Bill Clark, who did most of the work of organizing this. I'm just the moderator, just kind of taking advantage of what he did. I want to thank you again, and, and so let's...